In the year 2000, an uprising began in Palestine. Like most Americans, Allison Weir, the editor of a small town newspaper in California, knew very little about the conflict, other than what she had gleaned from the evening news or newspaper headlines. Neither a Muslim nor a Jew, she nevertheless became more curious about the topic of the Palestinian uprising. And as she researched it, she became increasingly suspicious that the American media were not telling us the whole story. Months later, she traveled to the occupied territories as an independent journalist to find out for herself what the U.S. media seemed to be omitting. Five years ago, I guess it was, I knew almost nothing about Israel and Palestine. I skimmed the headlines on the topic, I accepted the confusion of what I read, and like most people, I just moved on. At that time, I was the editor of a very small newspaper in Northern California, in Sausalito. I was writing about the local school district, the city council, the local fishing fleet. The Middle East seemed distant and really irrelevant to my daily life. But then finally, when this current uprising began about five years ago, and I began to see on television those scenes of children throwing stones against tanks, I finally, at this pretty late stage of my life, grew curious and wondered what this was all about. I decided to finally pay attention and try to just understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And when I did that as a journalist, I very quickly picked up something I should have noticed before, which was that we were getting a very one-sided view of this conflict. I began to look into it more seriously. I began to pay more attention to the news reports, to read them all the way through, to listen to NPR uh, very carefully. And as I did that, I realized more and more that this was appearing to be the most distorted issue I think I had ever come across. I finally decided I needed to go and see for myself. And so began the most unusual trip that I've ever undertaken. During my month of traveling through the Palestinian territories, I had found a population under siege. Throughout Gaza and the West Bank, people were being kept virtually in prison. I found that there were Israeli military checkpoints that limited and often totally prevented, if you were Palestinian, ingress and egress from their towns and villages. And by checkpoints, I don't mean toll booths or something. I mean soldiers in combat gear carrying machine guns, often sitting in tanks. I went through residential neighborhoods that were bullet riddled. Homes with large holes in the roof through the wall, bombed out homes. When children saw that I was interested in the spent bullets scattered on the floors, they brought them to me by the handfuls. In Gaza, I saw beautiful agricultural lands bulldozed, orchard after ancient orchard that had been raised. I saw 100-year-old palm trees next to the sea that had been flattened, an entire grove of them. I saw families whose breadwinners at that time had been out of work for five months, now it's five years, because they were not allowed out of their towns to go to their work. I met people who were the only ones still working for an extended family of 40. This is the reality in occupied Palestine. I talked to women living in tin shanties and tents in the dirt. They had had homes. They were not inherently penniless people. One woman had had two homes. One was for her son who had just gotten married. But Israel had wanted their land, so it had bulldozed their homes. Since thousands of children, literally, have been injured by American weapons, they're not hard to find. I saw boys with holes through their stomachs, in their heads, in their backs. I saw a brain-dead 12-year-old. He had dared to throw stones at Uzi-carrying, tank-wielding soldiers. I saw boys who will never walk again. They won't skip. They won't have children, they won't frolic. Their childhoods are finished. This is what I saw in Gaza. And then I visited Ramallah. I visited a newspaper office with sandbags around against the bullets the Israeli military shot at them on occasion. And then I visited Bethlehem where I saw an infant. I saw a hospitalized baby whose mother had not been able to visit him for months because she was not allowed out of Gaza to visit her sick baby. And this is what I saw in Palestine. But it's not what I saw when I read the San Francisco Chronicle when I returned to the United States. And I went to the library to see, upon my return, 
what the newspaper had printed for the 30 days that I was gone. As I looked through the pile of newspapers, I was appalled at what had been considered news coverage. I discovered that there had been no mention of nine-year-old dead Obai, no mention about a mother of three being killed in Ramallah, nothing about paralyzed children or women drinking tea in the dirt. Instead, I read only about an Israel under siege. I found it difficult to answer their questions. I was tired of telling people that Americans don't know what we're doing, that our newspapers don't tell us. Three months after returning from Palestine, Allison Weir quit her job and founded If Americans Knew, an organization dedicated to quantifying the ways in which the American media was misinforming the public about the conflict. Ms. Weir explains her group's methodology, analyzes the data, and reports on the key findings. We decided to really look into the news coverage of Israel and Palestine analytically and statistically to really understand what is going on. And we decided to choose clear, objective categories that would be as immune as possible to subjective interpretation. And we decided to look at how deaths were being covered by our media. Now the important thing is that we looked at how deaths were being covered among both populations, Israelis and Palestinians. It's my view, and I'm sure yours, that they're all human beings, that all human beings' deaths are equally tragic and, and quite newsworthy. We looked at the first year because that's such a significant period. First impressions are so powerful. They lead us all to conclude about who initiated the violence, who is retaliating, who is the victim, who is the aggressor. It's very significant. Then we decided to also look at the coverage for last year, for 2004, to see if any patterns we discovered in the first year were then continued in the second year or whether coverage changed significantly. We specifically studied the New York Times and the three major networks. We looked at ABC, CBS, and NBC, their evening primetime news shows. Now to do this study, the first job was a very sad job to discover how many people had been killed during those two years, how many Israelis and how many Palestinians. And to learn that fact, we went to an Israeli human rights organization, B'Tselem, which is very respected and quite careful in its gathering of data. It gathers information for both Israelis and Palestinians. So in looking into how many people had been killed in that first year, we discovered that 165 Israelis had tragically been killed by Palestinians and that 549 Palestinians had tragically been killed by Israelis. In 2004, what you discover is that 107 Israelis had been killed, which was a reduction. It was about 30% less than the first year. So they had experienced a calmer period of time. For the Palestinian population, however, you discover that the n amount of death had greatly increased, that 821 Palestinians had been killed during that period. Uh, that they were, therefore, Palestinians were being killed last year by a rate of 8 to 1 over Israeli deaths. Now, keeping those numbers in line, we then looked at what the New York Times had reported and what these major networks had reported. For example, we found that ABC had covered Israeli deaths at a rate 3.1 times greater than Palestinian deaths. We discovered that CBS had covered Israeli deaths at a rate almost four times greater, 3.8 to 1. We discovered that NBC covered Israeli deaths at a rate four times greater than Palestinian deaths. In other words, for just to take one example, uh, CBS.